Welcome back to Tip the Tally Films, and I'm going to go back to OG podcast mode from when I first started. I brought a guy in that I really have begun to trust over the past six to eight months for his Ravens content. Uh, Cordell Woodland, a good guy in these Twitter streets that kind of shares the same views and viewpoints that, that I like. And uh, let's get into this interview with Cordell Woodland from 105.7 The Fan. All right, so welcome back to the Silver Teller Podcast. And today we're going back to original podcast mode, what this show originally started as. And today I have my first podcast guest in a long time since Courtney Cronin, who is now a member of the ESPN, you know, um, family. And uh, I have Cordell Woodland, who is the host of the Shaking It Up Sports Show. And he covers the Orioles and Ravens for 105.7 The Fan in Baltimore. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Cordell. How you doing today? What's going on, man? Appreciate you having me. And he's become one of the 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 journalists that I I go to for my my Ravens content. One of the guys that I trust that I know is gonna come with the real and not none of the fugazi stuff that some of the other guys put out there. So he's one of the guys I go to that I I, I know is gonna be real. I know it's not gonna be none of the 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 fake news, the the the, the clickbait that we get from some guys. And he's also a fellow HBCU alum, a Morgan, Morgan State Bear. So that's, that's another reason why I wanted them to to come through. How was um your HBCU experience? Oh, it was dope, man. Um, you know, it was uh new for me to be in a different area. I'm I'm a DC guy, so to move to Baltimore is kind of I mean it's close, but th- those are two different worlds. <laughs> um, the, the, regardless of how close they are, but uh, my aunt went to Morgan uh, mm-hmm. in the in the I want to say late '80s, early '90s, uh, and so she want you know that kind of kept that pipeline going. But yeah, man, Morgan was great to me, man. It, you know, it, it it gave me the opportunity to kind of find myself and uh, get to do some of the things that I was really interested in. I was a videographer for the football team uh, for four years. I um, did some things in the communications with the sports program. I covered the Ravens for WEAA, um, which is a radio station owned by Morgan State. Uh, I think I was the first uh, student or post-grad student or whatever to to cover uh the ravens on behalf of weaa so that that was cool to be able to kind of break ground uh to do that for them uh but yeah man i i, I love my hbcu experience I, I wouldn't change it for anything and i had the opportunity to do both i my undergrad was at southern mississippi which is a uh, pwi my master's mm-hmm. was at alcorn but and which is you know hbcu and i grew up 45 minutes from Alcorn. So I went to – Alcorn was basically in our culture. We went to all the football games. Steve McNair was pretty much the the hero growing up. We went to – I all went right. to pretty much every football game he he uh, started. And it's for, you know, after I missed his very first game. But after his, his, uh, his aura came out and he was what he was, we didn't miss a game after that. I remember yeah. my uh, taking the ACT and just basically Christmas tree in the ACT so I can get out of there to go watch him play and but uh my, i wouldn't trade my my experience for all and if i could go back i would do undergrad and masters at, at all coin even though you know southern miss was good to me but i would do both at all coin because the, it was different i was more than just a number at, at, mm-hmm. at all coin and i and i loved it but um i also want to say uh happy birthday I see that you're a fellow May baby as myself, six days oh, after yeah. me. <laughs> so appreciate uh, it. Team I'm Taurus in the building. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. I see that you took a trip to, to LA. How was LA? Yeah. Oh man, it was dope. Uh in my younger years, I wanted to live in LA before I realized how much it costs to live in LA. <laughs> um, but you know, if I ever find a way to <laughs> get into that type of tax bracket, we may revisit that. Uh, but it was dope, man. It was dope. First time out there, got to go to the uh, go to game three of the Western Conference Finals, uh, seeing Braun for the first time. Uh, that's that Braun is my favorite player in the league uh, right now. Um, probably my second favorite player of all time after Allen Iverson. Mm. Um, so being able to see see them, uh, granted they lost. I'm not a Laker fan. I could care less about the Lakers. Honestly, I despise them. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it was dope to be in the building, to, to be in crypto, just being out there, man. It's, it was an inspiring trip for sure, just to kind of 
um, set my sights on, you know, kind of where I want to be to kind of continue to just shoot for the stars, man. And I've had to, uh, you know, I have my own show and I'm covering the two teams, the two professional teams in Baltimore right now. And it's crazy. I've had to tell people, it's like I've, I've kind of had to rewrite my goals a little mm-hmm. bit um, because my ultimate goal at one point was to get my own show. And, you know, I'm, I'm able to do that now. So, you know, it's a good thing that I'm kind of reevaluating uh, my goals right now. Um, but going out to L.A. was just an inspiring thing to kind of show me that, you know, obviously I, I've been out the country as well and stuff like that. But I, I just it had been a while since I had taken a trip, gone mm-hmm. on any type of vacation, at least a year and a half. Um, so it, it just kind of gave me that, that refuel, uh, that I needed to kind of come back and and hit the ground running. Doing that, taking those trips would do that. And I didn't have this on the agenda, but it, when I growing up, I kind of lived in this little box and Mm -hmm. I I tell people that when I got with my wife and was able to travel outside that box, it kind of reset my brain as to what I want to accomplish in life. And yeah. going out of the country and seeing different parts of the United States made me want more out of life, made me want to do more. And taking trips and seeing that, and I'm, I imagine L.A. would do that because you also have oh, yeah. an iconic picture that you posted. That picture of you standing in the middle of the road with the row of palm trees, I love it. Uh, yeah. That's, that's yeah. an iconic L.A. picture. that I, When I see people mm-hmm. post that, that's that's classic L.A. That's it's no, almost, no it almost, almost reminds me of Snowfall. Mm-hmm. It did. It, 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 that street honestly <laughs> reminded me of Snowfall. I was like, I gotta, I, I gotta get a pick on this street, man. And it's crazy. I mean, just just being out there, they always say you never know who you'll see. Like we're just walking around Hollywood, and we end up seeing a crowd. And I, I, I see somebody on a mic, and I, as we get closer, I see it's L Cool J mm-hmm. on the mic, and and he's talking to the crowd, and and then I find out that he's presenting Ludacris, who was getting his star on the uh walk of fame that day ironically enough he got his walk he got a star for acting not Mm -hmm. music uh Mm -hmm. which was crazy so uh like i said man you see some of those houses in the hills and you you see how much it costs to live out there and you just you 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 see the stores and just you know it's a it's a totally different lifestyle out there in general and look at money isn't everything i'm definitely happy with where i am right now understanding that i'm not a finished product understanding that you know i still got a ways to go um but i i i'm I'm always looking for an opportunity to be inspired and i think that's what that trip did for me cool 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 now did you uh, always want to be a journalist is that was always a goal of yours well it's my it started as me wanting to be an athlete you know, mm-hmm. I, I grew up uh, playing football. Football was my first love. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm I'm a smaller guy, so I don't look like it. But, I, man, I was a problem. I, I used to be a problem <laughs> uh, out there. And, you know, I, it was just really like I was for a while. I was just locked in on I'm going to the league. And that was it. Of course, everybody thinks they're mm-hmm. going to the league. And then, it, you know, you get to that realization that you're not going to the league. And it's like, what do you do now? And mm-hmm. I was uh I was working in the federal government in DC for a while and you know I was making good money and I'm uh you know got benefits and everything I'm stable but it just wasn't fulfilling for me you know I I, I didn't enjoy what I did I'm getting up early to go to a job I don't like to do I'm getting up early to go work for somebody I don't want to work for mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying and so um long story short I just ended up finding out I mean it took a while for me to figure out what exactly I wanted to do. But sports has always been a passion of mine. I've, I've always talked sports and everywhere I've been, I've been known as kind of like the sports guy. Mm -hmm. So it just hit me one day, like get into radio. I I grew up listening to John Thompson and doc Walker and all those guys on the radio. And my father used to have the, uh, the car phone. So I remember watching him call into the radio shows and stuff like that when I was a kid and and that really I think uh birthed my love for radio sports talk radio specifically and so I used to do the same thing once I got old enough I used to call in the John Thompson show uh and and it became I was like a regular caller and um I got the opportunity to get an internship to work with John Thompson on his show so 
you know, that was one of my, my favorite things to the fact that John Thompson called me his friend, you know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? The legendary coach, John Thompson, that, that's one of the things I, I hang my hat on uh, to this day. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, it, it just became a passion of mine. Sports was always a passion of mine, but talking sports and talking it on the radio was something that I, I just always felt like I, I could, I could do. And thankfully to sports, you know, I don't know what I'm doing that makes it work, but they keep cutting my mic on. So, you know, I'm, I'm still around. So when you were at Morgan, did you take uh, journalism? Was that your major? Did you take classes in yeah. that? Okay. Yeah. So uh, broadcast journalism was my major and I, I did a, I didn't do much at the radio station there. Uh, mm-hmm. I did some podcasting with some of my friends at the at the school, but I didn't do a lot of what I do now while right. I was a student at, at Morgan. So how did you end up with the job that you have now at 105.7 The Fan? So, uh, like I said, I, I had the internship working at ESPN 980 in D.C., mm-hmm. uh, and I got to work on shows like the John Thompson show and the Tony Kornheiser show in the morning. Mm. Um, and, and my boss at the time, Chuck Sapienza, uh, he was the producer of John Thompson's show and he ended up, uh, he, he was the producer and he ended up getting me the gig to be, uh, the intern there, uh, for a year, uh, because he was the guy that would pick up the call, pick up the phone when I called into the show. So he knew who I was. And so, um, after my internship ended, Chuck actually got, I think, promoted, um, and he brought me back to be a, a paid employee. And he just started adding more onto my plate. I went from being just a board ops, you know, that's uh, running games that were running at night or games on the weekend uh, to somebody that they were sending out to cover Georgetown, uh, you know, uh, the Wizards, uh, the, the, the Nationals, the Capitals. I was covering pretty much every team in the D.C. market. And um, long story short, I ended up losing that job um, because I had went on a birthday trip to Miami. I came back, thought I took a couple of days off. I didn't, or I guess it wasn't approved, one or the other. Um, And we were the flagship station for the Orioles at the time. And I guess I was scheduled to work and I wasn't there. And the Golden Sun and radio is dead air. You don't have dead air. Um, especially when you are running a game that you're a the flagship for, which is the Orioles, uh, because that's the big money maker right there. So I was scheduled to work. Long story short, I showed up. I mean, by the time I figured out I was supposed to be there, I I tried. I got there as fast as I could. I and let's say the game started at one. I probably got there at like one forty, one forty five. So I don't know how long it was dead air, dead air, but it was it was dead air. Um, so they had to let me go, you know, and it was the first screw up I had had. Uh, and, you know, Chuck had told me at the time he didn't want to fire me, but it was, a you know, it was above him at that point. You, you start losing the station a certain amount of money, man. It's, it's nobody that can save you. So long story short, I, uh, I was at Morgan and Chuck, they, they had a sports seminar and Chuck was one of the speakers and I wasn't even going to go. I didn't know about it. And one of my friends had showed me the rundown of the guests that were going to be there. And I knew all the guests that were there. That kind of let me know that, okay, I'm, I'm a little, you know, I am a little connected and more connected in this business than I originally thought I was, um, especially in that market. So I go and Chuck sees me and, you know, it was all love. And he's like, man, let me know if you need anything. Cause he told me he's now the, 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 the guy at 105.7. I'm like, well, I could use a job. And, you know, he brought me in. He hired me, and I worked my way back up. I'm doing Orioles games on the weekends. I'm producing shows on the weekends like Bruce Cunningham. And then eventually I get the gig to produce Inside Access with Ken Wyman and Jason Lockham 4. And the pandemic was rough. The pandemic was really rough um, because especially I think for producers, people don't understand what producers do. I, I try to give producers love as much as I can because I've come from that field. And it's a, a people don't understand that producers are the backbone of these shows. They, they do a lot that people don't get to notice. You only notice it when they mess up. Um, so, uh, during the pandemic, we didn't have our show hosts in the station, but the producers had to come to the station. And at that time, I wasn't living in Baltimore. I'm still living in D.C., so I'm commuting back and forth from Baltimore to D.C. And and then when I get to the station, I'm the only one in the station. 
uh, while the hosts are at home and you no know, faults of their own. They're doing what they're told to do, but they get to do the show from the couch and watch <laughs> ESPN and do the show in their draws and stuff. And it's like, man, they're living, they're living a the dream. You know what I'm saying? And uh-huh. I just got to a point to where it's like, man, I should be putting my show together. I, I I think I'm I'm done putting shows together for other people. I want to put some. I want to put my own thing together, and I kind of jumped off the bridge and I, I quit. I, I just straight quit, you know, um, because I just felt like if I had kept going with what I was doing and just showing up every day. And granted, I was doing a good job, but if I allowed it. I felt like they would have kept me in that producer role. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I, I had to kind of just force their hand a little bit. And I left it. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy at all because it's tough to get into this business. Um, I noticed that once I was let go at ESPN 980, there was a gap between then and my time at 105.7. So I leave 105.7. I go over to WEAA, the Morgan State radio station. That's when I'm covering the Ravens for them. And then after that year, Chuck calls me and he's like, man, we want to, you know, we want to bring you back. We want to have you cover the Ravens, want to have you cover the Orioles and we'll get you your own show. And, you know, it's kind of not to steal Mike Elias's line, but it's it's pretty much been left off from there. That's that's a good thing, because um, when you I feel like when you when you do a good job for other people, they try to pigeonhole you into that spot to continue to hold you there to lift up other mm-hmm. people and don't want to let you do your own thing and you got to kind of so bet on yourself so to speak yep. and when you bet on yourself sometimes when you bet big you win big and a lot of times when you're working for other people you learn what to do what will work and what won't work and you can yep. put it into play for yourself and that that's always a good thing um have you ever since you work for you cover the Orioles and the Ravens and a lot of these times you know being a sports fan we all have guys that we kind of look up to have you ever been in a situation with either team where you've been like in awe of a guy like you know covering a guy or having to interview a guy or having to you know ask questions have you ever been like starstruck with either, either one of those teams not not really i mean Lamar a little bit mm-hmm. Lamar a little bit just because Lamar's different. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, uh, I, I think Lamar carries a lot of weight for for the black community. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you look at what he's been able to do in his career and the barriers he's been able to kick down, I, I think he has done uh, a lot in that regard that he doesn't necessarily get credit for. And I don't even know if he understands the impact that he has had. I mean, Think back to all the years where it would be these black quarterbacks that come through college and have the style that Lamar has. And the first thing that the league wants to do is switch their position like they tried to do with Lamar. And not only did he not allow that to happen, but he excelled and blew everybody's mind. And what I love the most about Lamar and his game is the fact that he I think he inspires a lot of young these young black kids that play football that their style of play can work in this league. Lamar still plays the way I did when I played Pop Warner. You know what I'm saying? And that's and that's what I love the most about his game. He's showing that it can be done. So I, I'm not going to necessarily say I was starstruck when I saw him. I don't think I've necessarily been starstruck off anybody I've seen from either team. Uh, but he was kind of the guy to let me know, like, man, this is – this is major. I'm 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 covering a team that has a unanimous MVP, a, a Heisman winner, one of the most high profile players, you know, in sports. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know that that was dope. Calais Campbell, another one. I mean, he's just he's been around for so long. He's done it all. He's a towering figure, um, <laughs> and he's got a lot to say. Uh, and he's a really cool dude. He's a really cool dude. One of the highlights was. I, for me, at least, talking to Calais, I think it was last season after a game. I can't remember which game it was, but we're in the locker room. And, you know, the media, we kind of – when we go in the locker room, we'll kind of hover around in the middle to try to wait to see who we can get to talk to. And Calais had – you know, we had kind of – I saw Calais over there. He's just sitting there. I, you know, usually you try to let the guys get dressed and everything. He's sitting there. He had just got out the shower. He's sitting there in his towel and stuff. So he kind of waved me over like, man, you, you know, you want to, you got anything you, you want to ask me? I'm like, sure. So he's giving me this one-on-one and I'm seeing all the other media members kind of look at me like, man, Cordell's getting a 
the one on one with Calais right now and stuff, and, and he was just so he was just so good. So it's been little instances like that uh, that I I do appreciate, but it's 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 been a while. I would have to say since I I felt like I was starstruck, and I feel like in this business, it's, you you almost can't because mm-hmm. you, you don't want it to you know take you off of take your take you away from what you should be focusing on. You right. you gotta kind of look at these guys as you know, your work. equals, your, 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 it's work, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, I, I'll go in as much, however I feel about that, those types of guys that, that I named or whoever else, you know, I still go in there and if I got something I want to ask, I'll ask it, you know, it, it really doesn't matter. All right. A uh, couple more questions left. Um, so how do you kind of structure your questions after a loss? Like when you when you go into the locker room or the yeah. whatever the conference room after a game, how do you kind of structure? Because I know after a loss, the temperament of coaches, and I know myself and being, and I know it's different because I'm a high school coach or was a high school coach. The questioning, how do you kind of? Because you want to get a good answer for whatever you're mm-hmm. going to report back to. How do you kind of structure your questions after a loss to to the coaches well, or to the players or whatnot? So the first thing is you got you 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 got to know who you're talking to. Mm-hmm. You, you hopefully you understand the people that you're interviewing, and you know their tendencies. So Harbs is going to be short after a loss. He, he's going to be super short. Um, and the tough thing about a loss is the fact that everybody has the same questions realistically everybody wants to ask the same things we all saw the game we all you know we we all know what's coming but you want to phrase the question in a way that is a way that they can accept because they're they're obviously they're pissed off Mm -hmm. you know they they just had they just lost the game so you want to put it in a way that doesn't seem confrontational You, you you want to put it in a way that they can accept it and and, you know, they can just answer the question. Whether it's short or not, it's, you know, it's whatever. But you don't want them to take offense to the question because they're going to be super sensitive mm-hmm. at that time. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is to kind of just, you know, put it in a way that makes them think. A lot of the times I don't really come – more times than not, I don't come with the question that I want to ask. I usually come up with it like kind of on the spot. Like as I'm sitting there, I'll I'll come up with a question. Um, maybe and, and maybe it'll it'll be a question based off something somebody else asked and something that they said uh, in response to that that sparks a question in my mind. But usually, I kind of just freestyle it, um, and I find that my questions are more organic that way as opposed. To, and there's nothing wrong with coming with questions prepared. Sometimes I do I do that as well. Um, but more times than not, I've noticed that I get better responses when it's more uh, of a freelance <clears throat> type of situation. But when but players, um, they're different. And players, you you kind of just, I don't know, it, it really just depends on the situation. And like I said, the, the person that you're talking to. Um, but I, I, I usually try to add something that's a little thought provoking and something that I can tell that they, I would think they want to talk about, like, for instance, last year, I remember after the Dolphins game, or maybe it was the Bills game uh, that the Ravens lost, and both of those were kind of collapses for them down the stretch. And I remember asking Lamar about the run game and how they weren't able to close out games with the run game the way that they were in the past. And I got one of the best sound bites of, of that season from him where he's like, you know, it's a new era. It's it's not just about um, running the football and stuff like that. Yeah, running is great, but you have to be able to throw the ball in this league, and that's when you really start to know started to pick up on Lamar wants to throw the ball. He he's tired of going out there and having thirty, you know, having a team have thirty to thirty five carry a game and stuff like that. So you kind of read the player, you read their temperament, you watch the game, and, and it's kind of like a chemistry. You put all that together, and you kind of understand what what should be asked and what the player or the coach actually wants to talk about does um in the, in that room does everybody get an opportunity to ask questions or do they kind of pick certain because we don't get to see how many people are in the room we only get to see mm-hmm. the player or the coach so does everybody in the room get an opportunity to ask questions or are certain people certain people picked 
No, nah, yeah, you get everybody gets an opportunity to ask a question. Now it's a it's kind of a free for all, so you kind of just got to jump in, you okay. know, and, and just go get it. It's not a raise your hand situation, mm-hmm. and they call on you. Okay. Um. So yeah, if you if you got a question you want, and that's you know that's one of the things I tell a lot of young journalists that are coming in. I started out in D.C. and their scrums, their media scrums, are probably like twice the size of the ones I see now in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So DC market kind of prepared me for this. And when I was out in DC, I'm not going to lie. It was intimidating. I didn't, I, I, I tell people all the time when I was out there, I didn't ask questions. It was very rarely that I asked questions. I just really sat and watched Mm -hmm. and I, 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 and I, I learned that it's better to not ask a question at all rather than ask a dumb question Mm -hmm. Uh, because these players or these coaches, they will let you know, if it's something stupid that you just asked, forget this whole notion that you heard growing up that there are no dumb questions. <laughs> there are dumb questions. Um, and they'll tell you about it. So you don't want to be that, that person. You mm-hmm. don't want to be that reporter. So now I, uh, you know, out here, yeah, you know, it, we, ha- and, and everybody's respectful. Sometimes you get into those moments where it's two or three of you going at the same time, trying to get your question out. And it's kind of like, all right, sometimes maybe somebody will be like, no, go ahead, you know, go to ask your question. Or it's kind of just like, all right, I got to over talk you and whoever's the last one talking will be the one to get their question out. But it's a respectful thing. It's just what comes with the business. Nobody takes it personal. But yeah, if you if you want to get a question asked, you, you can do that. Gotcha. And when, as far as a win goes, when is it, it the the rapport with the players in a, in a win as far as opposed to a loss? Is it like completely different? Uh, you can pretty much ask anything you want because everybody's happy go lucky, or are the, is it the same thing? Is because I know, like you mentioned, Harvard's being short in losses. Is he much more open to expanding on different things in a win or what? No doubt, no <laughs> doubt. He's a different person when they win, <laughs> you know. Um, and he's a different person as at the start of the season mm-hmm. compared to what who he is at towards the back end of the mm-hmm. season. Um, the injury questions will be answered at the start of the season, but as the year goes on, he's going to cut those injury questions out. That's his number one pet peeve. Um, in terms of players mm-hmm. and uh, regarding a win, yeah, I mean, it's totally different. Look, when you go in the locker room after a win, the music's blasting, guys are dapping each other up, they're talking at the locker room, they're, they're hanging around after a loss, man, silence. Guys are in and out of the locker room. They may not even shower. They may just throw their clothes on and get out of there before we can come in there. So, you know, it, it's a totally different vibe. Um, and, yeah, they're, they're more open to some of the questions after a win that they may not want to answer after a loss. You could you would definitely have a lot more wiggle room after a win. Uh, so, so, yeah, they, you know, they're, they're human, you know, just, just like us. When things are going great, you know, everybody's in a great mood. And when it's going south, they don't even want to look at you. Got you. Do you cover any Maryland uh, Terps football? Do you do anything with those guys? So I haven't. I didn't this past season. At one point I was. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was covering football and basketball for them. I, during the COVID year, I was actually covering the basketball team with Sticks and and uh, Cowan and all those guys more so the year that the Terps were balling i mean they, they had just won the big the big 10 and they were primed to look like they were going to make a deep run in the ncaa tournament that year but COVID hit and it mm. shut everything down um but ever since then i haven't i haven't covered the terps um and to be honest covering the ravens and the orioles kind of gets me through the year mm. uh because they overlap and even in the the little bit of the off season where you have the that uh, January, that that February and March time, even mm-hmm. a little bit of April, where there's no football and there's really no baseball either. There's still enough going on, uh, at least this past year with the Ravens to kind mm-hmm. of keep me going. You know, we had the Lamar stuff going on. There's always something right. uh, to talk about. So uh, that kind of gets me through the year, and especially <clears throat> when you talk about football and basketball, uh, specifically basketball. Um, that's going on through the during the football year, and I mean Ravens practices are pretty much almost every day, other than Mondays and Saturdays during the mm-hmm. course of the season. So it's it's tough to go from Owens Mills to to College Park mm-hmm. uh, on on a daily basis. And, and if I'm covering a team, I want to be there. 
I, right. I, I got to be, a, you know, be around the team on a regular basis just to keep up, to, just to stay up to date to what's going on. So I don't, I, I don't want to ever, you know, halfway do it. And that would kind of be my fear with doing the Terps right now. Not to say I couldn't do it. I could mm-hmm. definitely make it work, but it, it, it'll be a stretch. Gotcha. And for, for, so I thank you for coming on and spending a little time with me. For those of you that, for those of my listeners and my followers that don't know where they can find you, let them know where they can find your content and your socials. Yeah. Uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, my handle is the same for both at Cordell Woodland uh, spelled just like my name, all one word, no spaces. Um, and you know, you can catch my show on one Oh five, seven, the fan, you could download the Odyssey app. You can listen anywhere, anytime. Uh, my show is on weeknights. If the Orioles play, then my, sh- if the Orioles play at, let's say seven, um, then my show starts at seven. I'm on from seven to nine. If the Orioles don't play or a day, uh, where they have a day game, then my show will be from six to nine. Got you, got you, got you. So again, I appreciate you for coming on. I uh, thank you for spending a little time with me. I know the Ravens actually have a indoor OTA today, so you may have a little work to do. And I again, I thank you for coming through. Uh, again, Cordell Woodland, uh, one o five seven, the fan and host of Shaking It Up Sports, a uh, fellow HBCU alum, a Morgan State Bear, and a May Baby also, uh, and a huge right. LeBron fan. Oh, I forgot to tell you that <laughs> I I did get to see LeBron one time myself. It, he was mm-hmm. a Heat fan. I'm a Heat fan. I'm a Heat fan. He was a Heat, I'm a heat member fan at the time. He was a, a yeah. good to know. He was. Uh, they had just won 26 in a row when he was um, in Miami, and they they lost to somebody. And I went to see him in New Orleans, and I didn't think he was going to play because they had just won that 26 games in a row. They lost to somebody, and I think I thought he was going to take a break. He didn't come out for pregame stretch. He didn't come. He didn't do a lot of the pregame warmups. It was like five minutes left before the game, and he finally came out of the tunnel to do in the like layup line. And I was like, "Whew!" Yeah, I had spent all that <laughs> money for them tickets just to see LeBron, and he came out the last minute. And I got some great pictures of him in the layup line, and they ended up beating the Hornets and AD. <laughs> Funny thing about that, right. that, I'll never forget. My son was maybe eight, nine, or ten at the time, and uh, the Hornets announcers was like, "We're giving away Anthony Davis bobblehead," you know, at the next home game, and my son looks up like. Who wants a bobblehead with a unibra? Because <laughs> he didn't, you know, he not, not wasn't a huge sports fan at the time, but yeah. you know, Anthony Davis was a unibra. And that was the funniest thing right. to me that, that night, just just to hear him say that. So, but again, I appreciate you for coming on, and I thank you. And again, I'll be following, and I appreciate all you do for us Ravens fans that can't be there. You you are our eyes and ears, and you and Jeff and some of the a few other guys are the guys that we can actually follow and we know we're gonna get some real content so thank you man i appreciate it for sure man appreciate you having me all right